Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us for today's webinar, Understanding the Arkansas Medicaid Waiver. I'm going to give it about one minute to let everyone come in here. Uh, we've got a lot of great information, so we don't want to don't want to wait too long. Um, like I said, I'll just give it one minute. We've got people coming in quick, so that's great. All right, it looks like we actually have um, a good amount of our attendees that have registered already on. So we're going to go ahead and kick off. Again, thank you for joining us today for the webinar, Understanding the Arkansas Medicaid Waiver. My name is Lainey Jennings Hall. I am the Marketing and Communications Manager here at Disability Rights Arkansas. I'm going to be your host and moderator today. Thank you for joining us. Um, this is going to be presented by uh, DRA's staff attorney, Derek Henderson. I'm going to kick this off with a few housekeeping uh, quick notes. This is a webinar, so if you haven't already noticed, your video and audio are automatically turned off for the duration of this webinar. If you do have any questions, um, please drop them in the Q&A option below. Uh, there will be a time at the end of this session for Q&A. We do ask that to help us keep the session as accessible as possible, uh, limit the chat post, use the private message feature to say hello to friends or any side conversations. Uh, this will ensure that any attendees using screen readers will be able to hear the speakers as everything posted in the chat pane is read aloud by the screen reader. If you do have any event related questions or issues, feel free to direct message me. I am, um, my screen name is DRA moderator and I can help you out with that. This session will be recorded and it will be available as long as any resources that we may have uh, shortly after. If you need any closed captioning, there's a CC option at the bottom of your screen. And then we have a leave, we'll have a link. If not, make sure you hit that CC button at the bottom. Um, transcribers, do you know, will there, will there be a link? Can you drop me a chat? I'm sorry, I should have verified that before. We'll, uh, we'll look for sure. If not, make, again, make sure you hit that CC option. Um, I'm going to turn this over to our speaker, Derek Henderson. Uh, Derek, if you want to kick it off, thank you for, uh, for speaking with us today. Of course. And Lainey, can you confirm that you can hear me? Yes, I can hear okay. you loudly. Okay. Uh, so welcome. I'm so glad to have everyone here. I'm so honored to be uh, just talking with you for a little while. And um, I have to start by telling you that, you know, while this is titled Understanding the Medicaid Waiver, um, that would be a lot. That would be beyond 90 minutes. And so uh, based on feedback we got during registration, um, we decided to you make a focus on managed care in Arkansas and specifically to drill down into what beneficiaries can do as self-advocates. And um, we'll talk a little more about um, why that is, uh, but due to overwhelming demand, we focused on that CES waiver and managed care. Uh, those other issues, I want you to know if it deals with eligibility or access, please reach out to us because um, we're happy to work on those issues. We do work on those issues uh, pretty regularly. And a lot of times it can be a new issue to me. I'm happy to learn those things. Um, we rely on you to let us work your case. And so if we don't have cases to work, uh, you don't learn this stuff. I don't learn this stuff. And you know, it puts me behind the eight ball being able to help clients down the road. So I'm grateful uh, to anyone who will let us work their case. Um, we, we just always feel honored that you would put that kind of trust in us. So a couple of things just about this presentation. Um, there will be some things that are highlighted and starred that um, I'll be including in the post presentation materials that should be coming out in a couple of weeks. And so in some cases, I needed to use some examples of past produced materials 
uh, I wanted to note that I used materials from Arkansas Total Care. The reason I did that is simply because they come first alphabetically. And so um, there's no message there other than they start with A. Um, also, when I refer to providers as a generic term, that could include supportive living, personal care providers, respite providers, or any other services. And so I, I tend to refer to that kind of generically, so just be aware. So why me? Um, why, why would I be talking with you about this? Um, I think it's because I am a good example that there's hope uh, for everyone. I started in this position last year with DRA with very little knowledge of Medicaid and waiver, and I had absolutely zero knowledge on managed care. And um, I've been very fortunate in this position to really be able to immerse in these issues. Um, I have to give credit to my legal director, Thomas Nichols, who was taking on a lot of these cases and still does, uh, but has put a lot of trust in me um, just to take it and run with it. And I, I've enjoyed it. Um, the past to me, it, it's a, a very personal thing. Um, it, it's come to be that for me because I just enjoy working these cases, working with you, um, the clients. And so this is really uh, an area where I've enjoyed uh, practicing. And I will say that between Thomas and I, we probably in the past year have completed more advocacy and representation on this issue, maybe than you know any other attorneys in Arkansas, which is not a, a slight. Um, we uh, a while back looked at every case that has been through DHS on this, and there are fewer than five attorneys, private attorneys out of 65 plus cases that have come through that we're aware of. And so private attorneys, um, there might be an access issue uh, for beneficiaries. There might be an issue for the private attorneys feeling confident in taking on something like this. And so we're really honored to be able to do so much of it. I also have to give um, you know a, a little bit of a shout out to some colleagues at Center for Arkansas Legal Services and Legal Aid because they do uh, at times take on some cases like this. Um, they may still be taking some cases like this or they may be referring them to us, but certainly, um, you know, we are happy to speak with anyone. Um, but I do want to mention that they have also been a partner in that. So, um, this audience, I was so excited when I looked at the registration. Uh, first of all, you know, the, the most, um, you know, honored guests to me always are the self-advocates and the family advocates um, who come to us to learn and uh, put so much trust in us. And so welcome and thank you for being here. Providers, so um, pleased to see so many providers. Um, in healthcare, home and community-based services, and long-term supports and services. Um, our clients rely on you so much, and thank you for what you do to help them have those independent, integrated lives in their communities. State agency staff, DHS, and uh, many other agencies, um, thank you for being here. Uh, we, we rely on you, and um, we, we just can't thank you enough for, for being a part of this. Nonprofit agencies, several, um, and so very happy to have them. And I am so pleased that there was so much interest from past employees. We have a very, very high number of past staff um, from uh, across all the passes. Um, I, I, you know, won't be saying, you know, that this person or that person was, uh, I just, you know, I, I think that everyone who could um, is here with us it is what it looked like to me. And I'm just so grateful that you're here. And um, it, it means a lot. So, you know, I'm starting from kind of square one and 
this is maybe sort of giving you an idea of how I learned a lot of this over the past year. So just from the start, what is CES waiver? Formerly, we called it DDS or DD waiver. That was for Developmental Disabilities Services. Um, CES is Community and Employment Support Waiver, and it still serves the same population as DDS, but that is what is now known as in Arkansas. And waiver, just in general, it's a federally funded state program that makes home and community-based services available for beneficiaries with intellectual and developmental disabilities. So the idea is to allow people to remain in their communities and have a full, maximum, maximally independent life um, and to have as much community participation and integration as they possibly can. And Ultimately, that's to avoid unnecessarily institutionalizing people. Uh, that would be a violation of federal law. That's a form of discrimination if a person is unnecessarily institutionalized. That is a whole presentation in itself. Many of you would be familiar with the term Olmstead, which refers to a Supreme Court case. Uh, that interpreted part of the Americans with Disabilities Act. And so avoidable institutionalization, that's Olmstead, and that's what we're, we're trying to avoid here. So how does a person get waived? Well, you have to have a categorically qualifying diagnosis, and that diagnosis has to cause three or more adaptive behavior deficits. So the qualifying diagnoses you can see here, and there are some differences in how those um, all would have to be diagnosed. Uh, some of them can be through one medical doctor. Some of them would have to be through two um, specialists and it just depends on the categorical disability. So if you have an, a specific eligibility question, that would be something that we would be happy to take through intake and speak with you about that and you know, possibly give some assistance or even representation if it's appropriate to do that. Uh, but th those are very fact specific situations. And I wouldn't wanna give you just bad advice shooting from the hip. So managed care is now the model for waiver services in Arkansas. And what is managed care? It's a way of administering a Medicaid program um, through a public or private agency. And these public and private agencies, they receive a fixed rate payment per member and in exchange for that payment, they are responsible for managing the provision of services to those members. And in Arkansas, I went a little too fast there. In Arkansas, um, we previously had waiver administered directly by the state. It's now administered by four managed care organizations, and those are uh, private organizations. So we created that by statute in Arkansas. It's called the Provider-Led Arkansas Shared Savings Entity Program PASS. So when you hear people talk about the PASS or if they talk about MCOs or managed care, in Arkansas, that is all the same thing. If you go to other states, they will not know what a PASS is. That, that won't be a thing for them. They may have a different name for it but managed care, that term should be pretty universal. The four passes currently in Arkansas are Arkansas Total Care, Care Source, Empower, and Summit Community Care. And again, those are just um, presented in alphabetical order. Um, the, the order doesn't have, you know, doesn't say anything about um, any of them. So please don't read into any of that. Um, 
we we've had clients from all of them and um we think it's important to develop working relationships with all of them so the passes were created through statute our legislature as a matter of policy adopted a managed care model and that's going to stay that way uh, unless um our our legislature at some point moves to a different model and so we are very invested in um helping our clients to navigate managed care because it is expected to uh probably continue in arkansas for some time um we follow in arkansas a model where the the passes network or subcontract with providers by statute the passes can provide services directly or they can have these subcontract or network agreements and ours all use the network and subcontract model so the department of human services dhs they have a contract with the passes you can see that i'll i'll include a copy of that contract and it is currently searchable and available on our website it's also available to anyone um, through a freedom of information request to the department of human services and because dhs's contract is with the passes um I understand that to mean that your recourse, when, when you want um, some relief, so, some redress on an issue, your recourse is to go to the passport. And there, there are several things that I think support that, but um, DHS is no longer the, the direct manager of that. And so the pass is your first resource to go to if you're a beneficiary. So before I really dig in on the passes, I, I want to start with a couple of assumptions. And the first one is this. Um, if you're a pass member, your pass wants you to get what you need to have maximum safety, independence, and opportunity in the place where you choose to live. And I mean that regardless of who your pass is right now, regardless of who it has been, I want to start with that assumption and, and I want you to buy into that if you're a beneficiary. I don't want to um, you know, undermine confidence. We we do represent folks uh, when there are issues with the passes, but I really believe that the passes want to live out this mission and they want to help you in your community. And I, I think that part of, you know. What supports that for me is what I told you when this began. We have so many past representatives on this call, and I, I'm pleased that you know I, I feel like they are supporting your um, right to enforce your rights when you need to. They're supporting your right to be an advocate for yourself, and so we're very happy to have them. And I, I do believe they want you to have that safe, independent life in your community where you want to be. I also want to start with the assumption that um, the past understands you do sometimes have to exercise your rights. And that includes asking questions. That includes asking for documentation. And that includes asking for a different outcome when you think you're not getting what you need. Um, that also, I, I think by implication includes, they understand if you bring us in as a partner with you, okay? Um, I have not ever had a pass um, that I'm aware of give a client a hard time about contacting a disability rights Arkansas attorney um, because they understand that, that we're here for you and you are simply exercising your rights. With that said, I, I will qualify that, you know, sometimes people say, well, I am, I am a little afraid to rock the boat. 
Um, I don't think that the passes want you to feel that way. I think they want you to develop as strong self-advocates. Um, I like advocating for you. I usually can't do it as well as you can for yourself. And so I want you um, as a self-advocate or as a family advocate to really you know, be thinking about how you can do that, but also don't be afraid. I'm, I'm not telling you don't call me or anything like that because uh, I love doing this. I would take every case uh, if we could, but ultimately people are usually better off um, if they can be that strong self-advocate. So I'm gonna jump in here. Um, when it gets to enforcing your rights um, as a beneficiary of a pass, there's a lot of regulation. There are a lot of things that passes have to follow. And that includes federal statutes, federal regulations, state laws that have been passed, state policies, state DHS policies, and the state contract. Those are you know, the most binding things. And then there's the terms of the approved Medicaid waiver application. That's publicly available. It's out there on the DHS website. Um, I will share it um, in those post meeting materials, at least as a link, it's very, very long. And then there are internal policies that the past develops. I, I want you to know though, that those federal statutes and federal regulations those are what really carry the most water and anything that conflicts with those uh, could be susceptible. It, it could be, you know, potentially um, invalidated uh, if, if it came to that. And so the federal statutes and regulations really govern and the word that we would use in legalese would be preempt everything else. So I'm a past member, what can my past do for me? Uh, that was a, a question that a lot of folks said in registration that they, they wanted to know about. Uh, the passes can through Medicaid unlock a lot of resources to help you have an integrated role in your community. And I, I would urge you to just diligently, you know, always be asking your care coordinator you know, when you identify a need, what do you know of, or what can you help me find that can help me to address this need? Because there are a wealth of resources. Um, I will note that in the last year's DHS pass manual, there was a, a pretty long um, section of describing different services. That has been trimmed down from the current DHS manual. So if you go on the DHS website right now, this time I'm not finding those and, and I will show you that list still. Um, that does not affect what is available, just so you know, because it's those things are all still included in the waiver application. And so just because it's not um, maybe as easy to access uh, that you know one little list, it's still out there in a couple of different ways that I'll show you. So previously, this was all in the DHS pass manual table of contents. And I kind of cut this and reformatted a little bit to get it all on one screen. Uh, the 280 section is now um, gone from there, uh, but there are other places where you can access these things. And so if you're wondering, okay, would this be an appropriate service for me? Or would this be an appropriate service for my family member? There are still places where you can get that. Uh, this is an excerpt from the Arkansas Total Care. I think they called this the waiver manual on their website. Uh, but if you look for member resources, you'll see they have member handbooks, provider handbooks. And I think that this one was called the waiver handbook. And this contains really um, detailed descriptions of what all of these services are. So right here at the bottom of it, you see supportive living uh, as a service and it's described in pretty great detail. I believe that those track very closely, if not identically to what was in the DHS manual. 
And so those things are all still out there. They're still available to you if you need um, a, a list or a description of those, then the PASS has those available uh, for you. Also, I am not sure if this is available for all of the passes, but I think all of the passes have available what are called the waiver codes. And waiver codes are all listed out just like this, uh, usually in a table. And these are the codes that are entered for different services. And so one of the most common is H2016. I, I deal with that one all the time, supportive living. And then you have different types of H2016, um, depending on the modifier letters after it. And so if you need just a quick, easy go-to list to know what services um, are available to a past member, go to that. That's one page of it. There's a whole lot more in the waiver codes. Also, I like the waiver codes because they will explain things like whether or not there are limits on uh, or, or you know caps on some of these things. Um, one of the other most common things that we get questions about and you'll find this in waiver codes are home modifications. Home modifications um, are available if they are medically necessary to help a person stay in their home or possibly approved for a different process called um, NCSS, which we'll get to in a minute. But um, those do have some yearly limits, but I, I'll encourage you always ask your care coordinator and your care coordination team about those limits uh, because sometimes there may be a little bit of flexibility in how, you know, from year to year those can be applied. Now, I'll interrupt myself for a minute to just give you a quick tip. And I, I doubt that I have to say this to any, um, self-advocate or family advocate, because you're usually better at it than I am. Keep good notes, okay? Document and keep good notes. Um, keep notes of conversations, keep notes of events that happen. When possible, um, put things in writing, and typically that would be through email. I realize text is, is catching on, and that's okay as well. Um, letters are still good in a lot of cases. And a lot of times this can be taken as a gotcha tactic. I don't want you to think of it that way. It's to help everybody. When you understand one thing and someone else understands that it maybe meant something different, that is problematic. And that's what often happens. It's not a deliberate attempt to avoid um, responsibility, it, it's often an honest under, misunderstanding. So send a, send a follow-up email to confirm what you understood from a conversation. Um, do email and fax when you want to request an item or a service. It's to help you, and it also helps the pass to have that right in front of them. So it, it really, I think, is for everyone's benefit who is involved in that system. But keep good notes. I, again, I don't have to tell that to a self-advocate or a family advocate. Uh, typically, um, y'all come in with five-inch binders, and you have everything, and you're better at that than I am. So how does my past decide what I need? I, I take those good notes, and I communicate clearly to them what I need. I put it in email and everything. Um, a couple of different things go into that. The first thing is the past is required to work with you to develop what's called a person-centered service plan. And that's commonly known as the PCSP. The PCSP is based on identified needs from your independent assessment. And I will also note that um, there's language in the contract that explains that the independent assessment is not the end all. Of, of everything. Um, it, the PCSP process is collaborative. It's ongoing. The PCSP is a living document. It changes. And so the independent assessment 
is a starting point, but the independent assessment is not necessarily what you know should define everything that goes into the person-centered service plan. So the PCSP, it's a collaborative process. Self-advocates and family advocates should be involved in it. Care coordinators and any you know, involved providers should be involved in it. And uh, it's a living document, so it can change. It should change. Um, I will note, and I, I'm gonna you know, kind of do a, a quick version of this. And many people may have questions by all means. Um, follow up, I'd be happy to talk more about this at the end or follow up individually with folks. But one thing that often comes up uh, in PCSP discussions is the concept of what's called natural supports. And I, I wanna talk about that briefly because I think it's so commonly misunderstood. And um, where that misunderstanding is coming from, I don't have any guess here. Um, I, I think it's just a common misunderstanding and between um, beneficiaries, providers, passes, sometimes we are not always on the same page about what that means uh, or what it can mean. So in the federal PCSP regulation, it defines a term called natural supports and natural supports are defined as voluntary unpaid supports that are, are given by you know a family member um less commonly i suppose it could be a close friend or something but th that's typically going to be a family member voluntary and unpaid and that's what i have to stress voluntary that word voluntary in the regulations there is no qualifier on it 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 is not voluntary and unable or anything like that. Um, there is no requirement that a family member prove um, that they can't give services or explain why they can't give services. It is simply a matter of voluntariness. And it also says in that regulation that natural supports cannot supplant needed paid supports. And so what I interpret that as is it can't be forced on a family it can't be forced um, in place of supportive living services that are needed or something like that now it does get a little more um you know complex obviously when you're looking at a situation where a person has guardianship over a beneficiary and so there is a legal responsibility to ensure care but from the passes perspective um it's either voluntary or it isn't and the way i've envisioned this and I, i've had some support from past employees on this kind of vision that I, I have here the way i think this should work is when the pcsp planning is underway the team says okay this is what we've identified are the needed services through the independent assessment and through our other sources of information and our discussion here we've identified that the member needs this many hours weekly of supportive living services and then the discussion is would the family wish to provide any unpaid natural supports. I will tell you that there are a lot of good reasons I've heard from people why they, they want some time that they do provide natural supports, okay? Even in this age now where a guardian can now work as a paid staff member, there are still good reasons that I hear. I've you know, heard people say, we like to have our weekends as a family. And I wanna have that really as a family, not as an employee. I, I wanna be mom or dad and not an employee at this time. So I, I have heard families really honestly want to do that and it does happen. Um, often I, I'm, I'm afraid that it happens in um, other ways. It, it happens through misunderstandings. 
Um, but I, I want to clear that up with you now. The way the regulation reads is exactly as you see on this screen. Voluntary, unpaid, cannot supplant needed paid supports. And if you think that there is an issue where that's happening and it's involuntary and unpaid, then I would really encourage a conversation with uh, the other folks um, involved in your care. So I've got a PCSP and we've identified needed supports. What if I need something else? Um, not, not that hard, I mean, you ask. And in some cases, if it is a major change, it may require that the team revisit the PCSP. Um, often I think the PCSP is written with enough flexibility uh, to support you know, some additions without um, having to necessarily revisit it. But you have to start a process when you want to add something. And, and from time to time, you have to start that process when you want to renew something. So let's say that you want to add something new, you want a new service, I would start by contacting your care coordinator. Um, always, always know who your care coordinator is and always know who you can contact if you are having tr contact or trouble contacting your care coordinator. Um, Care coordinators from time to time, you know, just for different reasons, they, they leave their positions. And so you may experience a change in care coordinator. And it may be that you don't immediately know this person has left and he's no longer my care coordinator. It may be that you have tried contacting that person and you're still getting his or her voicemail and you just don't know why they're not calling you back. So if that should happen, I, I would you know, strongly encourage you have a backup plan. Um, the three things I would keep in mind, member service line as, as your first go-to. Um, the member service representatives, they typically are very helpful. Um, and if you say, I need to know who my current uh, assigned care coordinator is, they should be able to help on that. If um, there's any issue with that, care coordinator supervisors, their uh, contact information for each pass is available on um, the DHS website. Um, my intention is when I send the, I didn't highlight that one, but I do intend to send um, that website where you can access that if you ever have to get up with those folks. But a lot of times the member service line, they could probably get you a little quicker because those uh, care coordinator supervisors are so busy. And then the third thing, which you should know generally as a resource, is the state pass on Budsman's office. Um, they are just impartial people who can help you navigate that system. And um, they, they are not um, attorneys or advocates um, in the role that we are but they, they can help you to find information and to navigate that system in a lot of ways. So be aware of them as well. Uh, I wanna say another quick word, um, and, and this one is on the concept of care coordination. Now, much like natural supports, care coordination is federally defined. It's uh, defined, I think, both in the managed care statute and in the regulation, but absolutely in the regulation. And um, it is required of every pass. It's required by the federal regulations. It's required by state policy, the state contract, and it is there at every level. I worry that sometimes there is confusion um, because of that term in what the care coordinator's role is. And I, I wanna be very clear that care coordination is something that is a lot bigger than just one job title or one 
um, you know, position at a company. Care coordination is the managed care organization's obligation to ensure that you have ongoing care delivered. It's their obligation to ensure that the care being delivered is appropriate to your needs. It's their obligation to coordinate your care between different settings of care, including discharge planning. And so if you are hospitalized for a while, or if you are um, in another setting, then your past should have people actively engaged in helping with your discharge planning. And those are only two parts of care coordination. Care coordination is big. Um, what I don't want is for anyone to think that when I say that a pass um, has to work on improving care coordination for a member, I don't want that to be taken as um, a slight against the care coordinator. The care coordinators do not by themselves have the ability to do everything that is required for a member's care coordination. And so um, those care coordinators will often engage other people. It's really important that you know other past leadership be involved when necessary. Um, so always start with your care coordinator, but if you feel like they are running into a brick wall, that they just don't have the ability to make the, the next decision that you need made, um, please don't be afraid to ask them, hey, can we get someone else involved in this? Um, you know, is there a care coordination team or a care coordination supervisor we can get involved in this? I think they're going to be very minimal to that because that is still you being a strong self-advocate um, and that reduces the number of people who, who might end up at the table. That reduces the likelihood that I might end up at the table. Um, and, and so I think that there's a lot of incentive for passes to, to really want to help you when you feel that you need more uh, in the way of care coordination and when you feel that you need that care coordination team to be bigger. So I've asked for something formally and what happens now? Well, um, a provider, a Medicaid waiver provider has to send a formal request to the past and that's called a, a request for prior authorization. Um, when the PA goes to the pass, then the pass determines whether it is medically necessary. Now, that term medically necessary, um, when you search federal Medicaid court cases and things like that, that is one of the most um, litigated terms because uh, it, it is defined in Medicaid, but it is, you know, always a tough term uh, to put your finger on. And, you know, from my layman's perspective, uh, it, the way it's defined in Medicaid is very broad. And so um, medically necessary, they have a medical team, every pass does, to determine that. Um, and that's usually the basis. I do want to note that there is another basis uh, for determining whether or not something can be approved, okay? If it's not approved through medical necessity, it could be approved as a non-medical community support or service. Um, that's called NCSS. NCSS is anything that is provided with the intention to prevent or delay entry into an institutional setting or to prepare a person to leave or assist them with leaving an institutional setting. Um, so the state is required uh, in the contract that passes considered in consider NCSS as a basis for approving PAs as well. So that that's always something you can ask for, um, and, and it's good to ask for that specifically. Please consider it as medically necessary and as NCSS. 
Um, you may also hear the term in lieu of services, which I think is related to the concept of NCSS. Um, that's to cover something that you know wouldn't normally be a covered benefit, but it would, you know, in that case, help you avoid institutionalization. So you have something submitted. It's evaluated as medically necessary. You're going to get a, a letter approving or denying it. But there, there is sometimes the issue that I ask my provider, I want this service. I want you to submit a PA for me to get this service. And the provider says, well, we don't give that service, so we are not going to submit that PA. That happens, okay? Um, providers do have, you know, areas that they work in and areas they don't. And so that does happen. If your provider says we won't put in for that PA for whatever reason, talk with your care coordinator. Tell them, you know, I, I really want a provider who can do this. I want a provider who can apply for this PA for me. Sometimes they can help you find an alternate provider to make that new request. That doesn't mean that that's a replacement provider. If you like your supportive living provider, then you should be able to keep them. And then you would just, you know, possibly have another provider making that other request for you. Um, that is sometimes called um, a pass-through request if it's something that's not a clearly, you know, defined benefit. If it's something like um, a home modification, then a home modification is completed through you know, a, a contractor, obviously. And so um, a, a provider would have to act as the pass-through provider. They would be the requesting provider, but then they would ultimately be kind of the middleman between that contractor and the pass. Um, so again, talk to your care coordinator. It should not affect, you know, your relationship with your current provider. So, Okay, I've done all of that, Derek. I've requested um, a PA, I requested a pass through, and it's being denied. I don't know what to do at this point. Okay, you've kept good documentation, uh, followed your procedure. Okay, so we're in good shape here because now we have some procedures available to us. It's probably time to consider escalating through a formal uh, complaint, grievance, or appeal at this point. And I want to stress, uh, this is something that's in place for the member's benefit. This is also for the pass's benefit, okay? This gives the pass an opportunity to say, okay, we understand now, we see in black and white exactly what you're asking for. And now we have the opportunity to really address it before it has to escalate further. So it's for the member, but it does help the pass. So I don't want you as a member to think, okay, I'm doing something bad here. I'm doing something that's gonna upset people. I don't view it as that. I believe that it helps everyone. So a complaint. Complaint is the lowest level uh, to ask for a formal response. You can make a complaint at any time. Um, passes can take complaints via phone or in writing. Now, I do think one thing that you, you want to be careful of. You want it to be formal. And so, you know, there are the informal discussions you have with your care coordinator. And, you know, even through text, I wouldn't consider those a complaint, okay? Because that's just kind of, you know, part of the process you go through with that person. So in your past member handbook, there will be a phone number, possibly an email, possibly a fax. There will be an address where you can send those complaints. I would do it in writing. I would always do it in writing. If you do it via phone, make sure you ask them, give me a reference number for this, please. Okay, so that you know it's actually been taken. And that way, if you have to take it further, you can refer to that number. Okay, so usually write it, phone, just make sure you got some kind of record of it. Um, I will say that um, you need to be careful in those past handbooks. 
the term complaint gets used several times. One of the um, ways it gets used is for like a federal civil rights complaint. Um, that will go to the federal office of civil rights and they will probably say, well, that's, you know, that that's not something we're gonna be able to help you with immediately. Or it could be something that they investigate for months, but they don't actually help you get a resolution to it with pass. And so you want this to go to the passes complaints department, not anybody else, just those, those handbooks, they are a wealth of information. And sometimes you want to be careful with that. Um, do you have to file a complaint? My answer is no. Um, you're free to file one at any time. I'll give you one caveat on that. Um, you can file a grievance instead of a complaint. And there are time limits on grievances. Complaints, it's not, not really clear whether there are hard and fast time limits. Grievances, that's where you start to have one. Um, when I say that there is one caveat I want to give you on complaints, um, some passes may in their handbook request that you start with a complaint before you do a grievance. The contract and regulations do not require this. And so I don't believe that you are required to do that. Uh, I, I think that it, it might be just a personal choice you make about whether you want to maybe start with that and, and see if maybe that is a more efficient way um, for the company to kind of process it. I don't know that. Um, I, I don't submit complaints typically, I submit grievances, but um, just be aware you do have a right to go directly to a grievance per the language of the contract and the regulations. Okay, so grievance is a step up. Um, but you can do that as a follow up to a complaint. I usually do a grievance first, especially if it's a serious ongoing issue. If it's something you've tried to work out kind of informally with your care coordinator and you realize the care coordinator um, just doesn't have the ability to make those decisions, then I would go ahead and put it on record as a grievance. Now, grievances have to be submitted within 45 days of the event at issue. Usually that's no problem. Usually the issues are something ongoing. And so there's not a, an issue of, oh, well, it's too long now. Passes have 30 days to resolve grievances. They will send you a resolution letter um, per DHS policy. This is policy 247.000. I, I cite it all the time. Um, you have a right following a grievance resolution to request a state fair hearing. We'll talk more about that later. Um, I am aware that in some cases, a past handbook may say um, to do a, an, an appeal with the pass of the grievance before the state fair hearing. Um, I don't believe that's required. You can choose to do that. Uh, but I just want you to be very careful about your state timelines because your state timeline is typically uh, going to be 90 days to ask for a hearing. We'll get to that more in a second. I'm getting ahead of myself. Um, that's what I just said. Um, some passes want you to do that uh, 90 days. So, okay. Let's say that it's not something I wanna do a grievance on. Let's say I applied for an increase in my supportive living hours and I was declined. I was told it's not medically necessary for you to have this increase in supportive living hours. I get a letter that says you're denied for this and it, it's supposed to give you the reasons for the denial and it'll give you a date. Okay, so with that type of adverse action. You do what's called a level one appeal. That's an internal appeal to the pass. And you ask the pass in a letter, in an email, in a fax. I want a level one appeal on this. I think that this is, this is what happened. This is what I want to happen. And this is why I think it should happen. Okay, so Occasionally, you might submit something, you call it a level one, the past may say, well, we're going to process this as a grievance. It's usually not a big deal because both of those come with a right to a fair hearing afterwards. So the, the level one goes to your pass. 
find that information in your handbook um, for how to send it in. Uh, some take it through fax, some don't have that number. Also, sometimes in your appeal letter, it will give you a fax number or an email that is not available in the member handbook. So pay attention to those letters as well. Um, with a, a level one appeal, you have 60 days to file for that level one appeal. That's normally uh, 60 days from the date on the letter. Level one appeals almost always have to be in writing. Okay, you can start it on the phone, um, but you have to follow up in writing within 10 days for most of them. That is something you might want to keep in mind if you find yourself, for whatever reason, very close to your deadline. You may find yourself saying, okay, I need to do this over the phone and then follow up in writing. Uh, if you do it over the phone, just be very careful. I, I would still have my notes written out and I would be very careful that I include everything that I would have included in a written appeal. So these are a few substantive rights that you have uh, from federal regulations. When you are going through a level one appeal, you need to know that you can ask the pass to give you a copy of your case file. Um, I think that that should include anything that you want that the past has. I, I believe that that should include any information. So be specific about what you want. Um, but you have to request it. And so be clear in your written appeal, I'm requesting this. They have to give you an opportunity to present evidence and arguments or orally or in writing if you request it. So request it if you would like to. Um, or if you write a really, really good uh, detailed appeal, that might be your oral or your, your written argument. So you have to have that opportunity with the pass if you would like to. Um, the pass will issue a decision on the appeal within 30 days of you filing for the appeal. So that whole process goes pretty quickly. Just be aware of that. There is uh, one other type of internal appeal. There is an expedited level one appeal. Um, I, I will warn you that, you know, you want to use them sparingly. You can do an expedited via phone. An expedited can actually be only through phone if you want it to be. Um, I recommend writing so that you can really clarify what you want. Expedited appeals are allowed when there is something that you know, taking 30 days to resolve it would endanger your life, health, ability to um, attain, maintain, or regain maximum function. Uh, if you do file for an expedited appeal, the pass has to address it within 72 hours. I, I would generally hold off on that um, and do a normal appeal unless there really is something that makes it absolutely necessary. And I, I have had those situations. Um, but what it does is it makes it harder for you to present that evidence and those arguments on a time crunch. So a little bit that I want you to be aware of with all of those levels, complaints, grievances, and appeals, write it out. Um, you have to be very clear about what your problem is. And one of the best ways to gain that clarity is write it out, even if it's only writing it out for yourself. Uh, be very clear about what you want asked to do for you. Be very clear about what you're asking. If you want records, ask for them directly. If you want to present evidence, ask directly. Now, as much as possible, uh, because this is what I would do, you've got to have a legal basis, a, a, a basis in some authority for um what you're asking and so you need to find dhs policy or regulations you need to find something to support it i i would generally say if you're trying to look at this yourself pass manual the medicaid pass manual is a great resource and i will include a link to that um because what it does is it usually boils down what the federal regulations and the state contract say. And so the past manual in a lot of ways might be your best bet. Um, and it includes some things like 
the fact that you do have that right to a grievance to, to an appeal following a grievance. You do have the right to go directly to the state hearing following a grievance. That's state policy. That's not necessarily federal policy. So the pass manual is really good at boiling most of that down. Okay, and big scary letters at the bottom. And, and this is so important for me as an attorney and so important for anybody. Raise all the issues that you think you can in your first attempt. Um, I don't think the law is entirely clear about whether or not you would be forfeiting those issues if you don't raise them in the level one appeal, but I don't even like to take chances. Um, if there's some new evidence you wanna share, try to share it here. What might happen is two things. The worst case scenario is that you default on that issue, that you try to appeal it later and the administrative law judge says, well, you didn't bring it up before, so you cannot bring it up now. Uh, more often, what would probably happen is it might be remanded to the pass. So the judge may say, the pass needs an opportunity to consider this new evidence. And so we're gonna send it back to them. And then it might still end up back with us again at DHS. And that, that's not the worst thing that could happen, but it does take some of your time. And usually you don't want to do that. So raise it in your first attempt, if at all possible. So um, let's say that I have finished a grievance and I got a resolution that I don't feel is satisfactory. Or let's say that I finished a level one appeal and my resolution to that is not satisfactory. Now I have available to me the state fair hearing process. This is an administrative adjudication process with the, the Department of Human Services. And you are asking an administrative law judge from DHS to basically change the pass's decision because you think that it should have been decided differently under the law or under the regulations or under the contract. So it's basically like court. Everybody gets to present evidence and arguments. You can be represented by an attorney. Um, and, and, and I do want to note that, yes, you can be represented by an attorney in those other ones, like grievance and a level one appeal. You can be represented by an attorney in those. Um, so you go to the ALJ at the state fair hearing, you present it and the ALJ will decide how the law should be applied. Um, he or she may default on an argument if you didn't raise it before, so just be careful about that. Um, you're asking, change this decision because we think it's not right, and I think I'm repeating myself here. That must have been when I was editing. Um, oh yeah, I've got all that on three slides. So typically, you have 90 days um, from the date of resolution to file for a state fair hearing. Um, that's in the federal regulations and the contract. So if the pass in your letter tells you any different, then this is still going to supersede that. Uh, I, I did, and this was, I don't even remember, you know, who this was, and I wouldn't tell you anyway, but um, I think one time, and it may not have even been a pass, but I, I saw a letter that said, um, you have 120 days from the date of this adverse action to appeal to the state. And I think what they meant was you have, you know, a certain amount of time to appeal to us, and then you have a certain amount of time to appeal to the state and we think it adds up to 120 days. So we're just saying 120. Um, and actually, I think that that was not accurate. Um, and that wasn't an accurate way of calculating time uh, in that type of case. So just be careful with that. Always pay attention to your dates because your past may not take the full, that you know, you, you may submit on the 15th day that you could have submitted. And then the past may, respond to you on the 15th day after that. And then you have 90 days from that date. So it just doesn't always add up um, to, to any specific number. So just be careful of that. 
So um, the state fair hearings, they are going to loosely um, follow the, the rules of evidence and um, rules of civil procedure in some ways, especially on things like how to subpoena witnesses. But the ALJ has a lot of uh, discretion in what kind of evidence they hear and things like that. Usually they, they uh, give those opinions within 30 days um, of the hearing or 30 days of the last submission if the attorneys say we would like to submit post-hearing briefs or um, findings of fact, conclusions of law, things like that. If a state fair hearing decision goes against you or if it goes against the pass, whoever the um, losing party is, uh, that losing party can appeal that to a circuit court in Arkansas. That is a very quick turnaround. I think that is 30 days from the date of receiving um, DHS's decision. And so you do have that right to appeal it to circuit court. And then from there, you have every right that you would normally have in court. Um, but just be, be aware that that's kind of a quick turnaround. There is an expedited appeal process, uh, an expedited fair hearing that can get you in front of DHS quickly, um, within days rather than within weeks. Use it sparingly, I do, because you have to be pretty sure that you are ready to go um, because you're not gonna have time to request a whole lot of information from the past. <sighs> All of this said, I, I wanna just bottom line this. Um, the bottom line is, if you are a past member, you have rights, okay? And what I'm sharing with you here, this is directly from the state contract, okay? So this is what the past agreed with the state are your rights uh, as their beneficiaries. And I've highlighted a few of these. I won't you know, read through everything. But I, I wanna highlight how important a few of these are. Understanding your PCSP and receiving, actually getting the services contained in it. That's a right. Participating in decisions regarding your health care, Being free from restraint or seclusion. And I want you to include in that seclusion that might be the result of not being able to maintain as independent of a life in your community as you would like. Requesting copies of your records, obtaining needed, available, and accessible health care services covered by the past, living in an integrated and supported setting in the community, and being protected. Okay, and you know, protection, um, if you have those other things, if you have what you need to live in an integrated setting, you're protected. And so those other things, you know, um, if you're not getting that, that means that you are not getting rights that you have under this. And um, you should be able to talk to someone about that. In the same contract set, section. I want you to know that it says this, the PASS and its participating providers are prohibited from treating an enrolled member adversely for exercising their rights as outlined above. And so I've told you about those folks who have said to me, I, I'm, I don't want to rock the boat. <sighs> These are your rights. The PASS wants you to exercise your rights, okay? And it can be uncomfortable. I, I get that. But I think we're all trying to get better here. I think the past is trying to figure out how do we serve folks better. And that starts with knowing that there is a problem. Okay. And so I want you to be comfortable sharing these things. Um, we're here. I, I'm always here. And um, I, I don't want anyone to get the impression that this is, you know, me trying to get this off of my plate. I love doing this kind of advocacy, um, but I also don't think I'm the best one at doing it um, when you are comfortable and equipped 
to do it yourself. And so um, I just want to say again, thank you um, for allowing me to present. And I hope that I've shared some things that at least maybe uh, help you to have some direction on um, and some insight into your situation and how you can, you know, get what you think you need, um, you know, as a self-advocate or as a person, um, you know, engaging help from us or others. And so, Lainey, um, I think that's all for me. Do we have any questions? Yes, we do. Thank you, Derek, again for that presentation. A reminder, if you do have questions, please use that Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen. Um, so our first question is from the kind of the beginning of your presentation, Derek, is IQ part of the criteria? Uh, yes, um, and, and it, it does depend on what the qualifying um, eligibility category is, okay? Um, if the only uh, qualifying eligibility is intellectual disability, then IQ is going to be a measure in that. Now, I, I want to say with that, um, I don't remember off the top of my head the exact language, but I, I believe that there's a little bit of what I would call equivocating language in that part of the statute, because I believe that it says something along the lines of generally, an IQ, uh, a full-scale IQ, um, I can't remember if it's of 70 or below or below 70. And so off the top of my head, I certainly wouldn't want to give advice, but um, with uh, ID as the qualifying, then yes, it would be. With some of the other conditions, um, then it, that may not be factored in at all. And so uh, it just would depend on what your qualifying condition is. Okay, next up, if a past member is requesting help navigating questions or needs related to HDC application, do those go through the past two? If not, what is the process for finding answers related to the HDC process? Uh, yeah, and I, I'll tell you why I'm, I'm probably not super well equipped to, to handle that question uh, with a great answer right now. Um, that, that is something that, that comes up from time to time. And I am aware of some cases where um, a pass has assisted with that. And so um, I'm not sure if that would always be. Um, and and I, I do wanna say that I think those were kind of special cases where there was still the overall goal of eventually uh, reintegrating into the home and community, but there were some uh, extenuating circumstances uh, at the time. And so I do know that in at least, you know, some cases I, I have seen some past involvement um, from that. But I, I will tell you that on my end, uh, we have, probably more experience um, in, in trying to help people to go from more restrictive settings to less. And so I have never asked myself the question of, you know, how, how do I help a person uh, to enter an HDC? I, I think that certainly anything, if you're talking about a, a change in setting, you know, talking with your care coordinator at first would be a good thing. I do want to note on that that um, that would be a long-term care setting, and so um, you, you likely are aware um, that you would eventually uh, your, your eligibility would go into uh, it, it. It would eventually become long-term care Medicaid eligibility uh, rather than pass managed care, and so. Uh, you would no longer at that point be a past member. Um, but you also, if you are in an HDC or long-term care facility, if you are discharging, then you would be a priority uh, beneficiary uh, to get back on the waiver. And so we know that the waiver wait list, you know, is typically 
years, uh, but if you are on it because you are discharging from an HDC uh, or an ICF, then you would be a priority um, beneficiary and you would probably be eligible um, for waiver within weeks rather than within years. And so just a lot to know there. And um, I, I would I would start by having that talk with uh, the care coordinator. Um, and, and this one may be a kind of a, a specific situation, I'm not sure. Uh, I live in extreme Northwest Boone County and services, especially transportation are limited to none. Any change to that in the future? Yeah, so I, I'm really glad that we, that we did get that from Lainey because uh, there there is a a concept a, a requirement with the passives called network adequacy, and that is a, a concept that I um, am starting to see um, probably becoming a bigger and bigger issue. Um, I don't I don't think it's because anything has necessarily changed right now. But um, network adequacy is the pass's responsibility to make sure that it has sufficient providers um, contracted or networked to give all of the state plan services. And the state has developed network adequacy standards. In some cases, those network adequacy standards are very, very specific. Um, it may you know state that the pass has to have this many PCP providers per this many members okay and I don't know those numbers off the top of my head but they are in the state pass Medicaid manual and we will be including that uh, a link to it at least when um, when we send materials so what you're your concern might be that you relay to your pass. You might start with, this is a covered service and I don't have access to it. And so what can we do about it to make sure that we have an adequate network that will give me access to this? So um, as far as plans, that I don't know. Um, those networks, um, the pass builds those networks and the pass, the passes I'm sure are always, you know, looking for providers um, to fill some of those gaps, but I do think it's important that you let them know uh, very specifically we have a gap here and um, I think it's important that you let them know in some way that gives you a record and gives them a record that you've had that discussion and made that request. Um, this person, uh, their care coordinator has changed several times in the last few years, um, and as a parent with autism, stability is critical. Is this a consistent issue amongst the past? Is this something that y'all, that you're seeing a lot of? I'm, I'm not going to say, you know, how prevalent it is because I don't think I have a good enough sample size, um, but, you know, you did hear me reference know who they are and then know who your care coordinator is and then know kind of who sits behind them. Um, obviously, I, I've run into that before. Um, ha having to address that issue and help a client address that issue, we, we do run into that. And uh, I, I certainly can't say, you know, what, you know, the rates of turnover are, you know, whether it's, you know, what it's like geographically, what it's like between passes, I, I don't know. And um, it is something that happens though. And um, I, I think that at a certain point, I would raise that as a concern um, that given your child's needs, you feel that you are not getting uh, the consistency that your child needs in care coordination. Remember that when we say care coordination, that, that includes the whole care coordination team and anybody in the, the managed care organization, 
who helps fulfill that care coordination obligation. And um, the care coordination obligation means that the pass ensures delivery of care appropriate to the member's needs. And so, you know, a lot of times we might say, for example, okay, well, we are, I, I'm just making one up here. You know, we're, we're paying for 24 hour um, supportive living services. And it turns out that um, there's just not great supervision of these um, direct service providers and they're on their phones all day and not tending to the member's needs. Well, then I would consider that a care coordination issue because the member is not receiving care appropriate to the member's needs. It does get tricky and, and I'll acknowledge something here that you know the, the, the passes um, don't have personnel power over the providers. Uh, the passes cannot hire or fire providers, but the passes are contracted with the providers. And when you contract with someone, you typically have ways that you can control and ensure quality in how they deliver their performance of that. So um, I, I can't speak specifically to, you know, what that looks like all over the state or, or between all passes, um, it's a concern. I would talk with someone about it um, because that might be affecting delivery of care. Laney, uh, I'm gonna say, um, as far as the, the question on day programs, I, I think that might be one, um, you know, for for a more um, in depth discussion, because typically when we're talking about um, refusal to um, accept into a program or something like that, that gets very uh, situation specific, and I, I would like to give a really good answer to that, and so. Um, I'd like to talk um, offline about that one. Thank you. Sorry, my mouse was uh, not working with me. I was trying to get to the to the button. It wasn't so. Thank you for that. Um, I have messaged uh, the attendee about that. Um, okay, we have one. Um, is the request of the level and appeal for the person who is trying to receive coordinated care services is denied once or twice by a judge, does he or she have to consult with his or her pass an attorney, even if they need to reapply for another appeal before a scheduled fair hearing? Okay, Lainey, tell me where that one is, because that one, I, I want to read that one. I'm not seeing it. Mm -hmm. It is the one, two, three, fourth. Okay. I think, okay, so I'm gonna tell you how I'm reading this question and certainly reach out to me um, on this because it may warrant more than what I'm going to share here. If the request of the level one appeal for the person who is trying to receive coordinated care services is denied by a judge. So when you say trying to receive coordinated care services, the way I, I interpret that question is you asked for an appeal on the basis that the pass was not properly ensuring that services were coordinating, were coordinated, um, either through not ensuring delivery or not ensuring coordination between services during discharge or something like that. Um, and, and then what, what could happen is, let's say you submit that as a level one appeal and at DHS, uh, DHS might say, well, we don't find that there's been adverse action here. Um, if that is the case, 
um, then depending on how much time has passed, you may need to do another appeal. Um, if there's a fair hearing scheduled, then you probably need to just go forward with that fair hearing unless there have been a lot of new and unique events. If it is something um, where, you know, we're just talking about, okay, the same lack of coordination has continued in the interim time, um, probably don't have to ask for a new hearing or anything. Um, I hope that answers the question. Um, I, I, I fear that I may not be getting it completely. And I would, I would really love to talk about that one to make sure um, that that's adequately addressed for you. Are you able to be on PASS and autism waiver or do you have to pick one? Okay, so I, I am not an expert on autism waiver. Um, the, the main caveat I understand on autism waiver is that it's going to be um, for a population 18 months to eight years old. And so the little bit of discussion I've had on autism waiver is that, you know, that would be a way to get some early intervention for um, your child while you're on um, DD wait list. And so um, chances are what would happen is you would get an autism waiver and then um, you would before um, before you're off of autism waiver, hopefully you'd be off the wait list, but you may not be realistically as long as the wait list is, although we've you know obviously, made efforts as a state to clear that up. Um, but with the passes, um, when you are found, when you apply for DD waiver and you're found eligible, then you're going to go through a process called independent assessment. Independent assessment, um, sometimes we hear that called optum assessment. Um, independent assessment, determines your level of need and you will be assigned as a level, uh, a tier one, two, or three. And so uh, if you are a tier two or three beneficiary, then that will um, necessitate automatic assignment to a pass. Um, even if you're not yet, even if you're still on the waiver wait list. And so I, I haven't had a situation of someone actually being on both because as a practical matter, um, that wait list is going to be um, long enough that's probably not going to happen. But um, you do want to go ahead and get that application going at the same time. All right, I think we have time for maybe one more question. Derek, do you have a, uh, do, you wanna, do you wanna pick one? We have a lot of questions and I will note, we will take the rest of these questions and we will um, send these out as kind of a Q&A for you guys afterwards. We don't want you to think that we're leaving your questions. There's just only so much time and we're so glad that we have these questions. We will get these answered for you guys. Derek, do you wanna, do you wanna pick a final question? Yeah, yeah I do actually. Um, I was about to say you're doing such a great job and then I saw that there's a, kind of a common thread here um, between a few. So it, it, there are a couple about natural supports and the interplay between that and guardians as paid caregivers. So let me just say a couple of things. Um, the new waiver application allows Arkansas to, to pay guardians, legal guardians who are also caregivers. And as we know, um, supportive living and personal care services, those those companies don't run like Walmart where um, you know they have a bunch of people and they say, okay, this person, you go here, you go here. It, it's typically a much more uh, personalized hiring process. And so um, often that includes family members being hired to give the services. So, a parent caregiver can be paid for services um, and a parent caregiver can still not 
be required to give care as a natural support um, in, play, in lieu of paid services. Now, I will tell you though, that, that that is playing out in a lot of situations in different ways. And some of it depends on the provider. Providers may say, um, we will pay for up to 48 hours. We will pay you for up to 48 hours of care um, a week. But the, uh, the parent may effectively be giving 96 or more than that of care. But the provider has said, this is what you get. Well, I would say um, we have a conundrum because we have to decide, and, and that I, I think that the past has to be involved at this point, um, will we continue to have a violation of uh, the natural support regulation, the PCSP regulation, or will we, you know, work with the provider to hopefully long-term fix this um, and, and not put 120 hours of care a week on a parent, um, because that obviously has implications on quality of care and on your health and well-being. Um, but then also as a long term, you know, as a long term, they need to look at that. But as a short term, will we, you know, talk to the provider about making sure that this is not an unpaid support in some way? Um, there's not there's not exactly one set answer. And I will tell you that we um, I certainly have taken matters to hearing at DHS on this and um asked that the, the the ALJ order relief but what I don't typically ask is order relief in this form um typically the pass has discretion on how they supervise the contract the provider has some discretion on how they carry it out but when it comes to well the contract is not being carried out therefore you know somebody is in breach DHS can um I think order that changes be made. And there, there are then ways to seek enforcement of such an order. So I say all that to say, if natural supports um, are talked about, you know, natural supports have to be voluntary. So make your position clear um, about what you um, voluntarily can do because parents have to be able to work um, to take care of their kids and parents have to take care of their own um, physical and mental well-being to take care of their kids. Nobody is better off um, by you putting yourself through the ringer um, on that. So please, you know, talk with someone. And if that means talking with us, we're happy to. Thank you, Derek. And thank you all for all the questions. Like I said, we will take the questions that are still up. There's a lot of questions um, and we'll get that as well as the recording and some resources out to you guys shortly. Um, we do ask that you take the survey that will come to you at the end of this. Um, this is how we know what you guys want to want to hear from from DRA. Um, speaking of, our next webinar is one that has had a, a big request. We've we've spoken on it before, but we're bringing back more on ADA and accessibility in April. I'm going to drop the link to that um, in the chat. That'll be on our website as well as social media. And then I do also want to let you guys in. We've got a big announcement. We are dropping the new agency podcast, including you. This is actually the first time we are releasing the link to that. Um, so we, our first episode will be on guardianship. That is now up on all of your podcasting platforms. Go and listen to that. Thank you guys for joining us today and have a wonderful rest of your day.